We are going live. Thank you so much for joining us for the second annual Flight of the Monarch Day. We're so excited to be bringing this live broadcast to you from Tommy Thompson Park in Toronto, Ontario. My name is Vicki Ann. I'm a Program Manager of Professional Development with the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, and I'm going to be hosting today's live program. And as we kick things off with Flight of the Monarch Day, we'd like to respectfully acknowledge that the lands we are situated on are traditional territories and treaty lands, in particular those of the Mississaugas of the Credit, as well as the Anishinaabeg of the Williams Treaty First Nations, the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and are now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Through our work with land and water resources within the Greater Toronto Area, the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority appreciates and respects the history and diversity of the land and is grateful to have the opportunity to work and meet in this territory. Now, you may be joining us from different places all across Canada, and we encourage you to explore and investigate the territories and treaty lands that you are situated on. All right, so we would like to begin things by extending a warm thanks and our gratitude to the municipalities that have proclaimed and recognized today as Flight of the Monarch Day. And these communities include the town of Ajax, the town of Aurora, the city of Brampton, the city of Markham, the city of Mississauga is lighting their clock tower orange in recognition and celebration of Flight of the Monarch Day today, the town of Newmarket, the city of Pickering, the city of Richmond Hill, the city of Toronto, the township of Uxbridge, and the city of Vaughan. And a heartfelt thanks and our appreciation to the families and organizations across the country who are celebrating Flight of the Monarch Day uh, today here with us. So we've got Royal Botanical Gardens and North Durham Nature. We've got participants from the People Power Challenge and the Owen Soundfield Naturalists are running a full day monarch tagging program today in Wyerton. So check that out. You can visit uh, Ontario Nature's website for more information on that. And we've also got the McMichael Art Gallery who will be offering native plant workshops and lots of interpretive hikes all day today in celebration. So as I mentioned, today I'm broadcasting from Tommy Thompson Park in Toronto. It's just outside of downtown Toronto and it's this really unique space specifically for monarch butterflies because it is a constructed landform that extends five kilometers into Lake Ontario. And the reason this is so significant is because peninsulas are very important to migrating monarchs. What happens on peninsulas is that they use that as a staging area and they use the trees and vegetation as roosting sites to prepare for that journey south to Mexico. So it's a really neat uh, spot. Um, in addition to the fact that it's a peninsula kind of reaching into uh, Lake Ontario, we've also got all of this beautiful meadow habitat. And we're going to do a quick exploration of what we can find here at Tommy Thompson Park today. I'm sure and pretty confident that we'll be able to find some milkweed, we'll be able to find some monarch caterpillars. And if you're joining us for the entire program today, we will be able to also uh, find some monarch butterflies fluttering around. It's really, really hot here today, and it's going to be bright and sunny, and the monarchs love nothing more than flying around on a sunny day. So come on, let's take a look through this 
little patch of milkweed. I'm going to make my way through the sumacs here and the tansy. And I see about 20 to 30 stems of milkweed over here. And you can tell that we're kind of entering this later stage of the milkweed. You can see the chlorophyll is starting to degrade a little bit, but there has been evidence here of monarchs and other insects from the milkweed community. You can also see on some of these plants here, on some of these milkweeds, that we've got seed pods forming. And these seed pods will hold hundreds of milkweed seeds uh, that will, and the pod will break open in the, the, the early fall and release all of those fantastic seeds, uh, which will be picked up by the wind. Now, does anybody in the chat know what kind of milkweed plant this is? We've got three commonly occurring milkweeds here at Tommy Thompson Park. We've got butterfly weed, which has these beautiful orange flowers. We've also got uh, some swamp milkweed in some of our uh, wet meadow areas. But in this meadow habitat, if you've guessed it, is common milkweed. You've got those big, broad leaves, super bulky, and they provide a ton of biomass for our growing caterpillars. Let's come a little bit deeper into this meadow. I think I see something here. Let's flip this little leaf over. We see that we've got a second instar caterpillar here just munching away. I'll try to hold that as still as possible. You can see all of the work that has been done on this leaf by that little second instar. And further in, if we can find, sometimes uh, the, the bigger caterpillars are a bit trickier to find because they love to move around and look for the perfect spot to pupate. And I do see this caterpillar right here. So you can see that this is an early fifth instar. And when I talk about instars, that just means the uh, stages or the intervals between uh, the times that the caterpillars will shed its skin. So it's the interval between molts. And this caterpillar, you can see that characteristic or sorry, yellow, black and white striping and the tentacles. You can see the socks and shoes on its pro legs. And you can see that it's also cohabitating quite nicely with some ants. Perfect. So those are the, some of the things that we've found in, in, this, uh, in this milkweed patch today. And I'm sure there's going to be lots more. Um, it is going to be a fantastic day full of really exciting live programming which we're going to bring to you today, um, throughout the days. And uh, yeah, so I'm really, really excited to be here at TTP. Thanks for exploring it with me. And I want to tell you a little bit about what we have planned and our schedule of events for today, so that hopefully you can uh, join us for some of the programs or join us for all of the programs that we've got planned. Uh, we're going to be welcoming the TRCA's Ravine Youth Team today uh, during the, uh, the entire day. So we've got lots of live programs that they have uh, been working really hard on and uh, they're going to be fun and really, really interactive. We're also going to be joined by a special guest who will share a traditional teaching with us about monarch butterflies. And so at 10.30, we've got our first Ravine Youth Team crew who will take you through the life cycle, migration and anatomy of monarch butterflies. That's Emily, Michelle, Sarah and Redmond. At 11.30, our second crew, Scott, Jacob, Adam and Caitlin will be joining us from Humber Bay at Budapest Park. And they're going to show you how to plant a monarch friendly garden. And at two o'clock, we've got our third crew, um, Doreen, Vandevin, 
uh, Vishal and Alessandro, who will be joining us from Evergreen Brickworks in Toronto. And they will also be welcoming storyteller April Nicole, who will be sharing a traditional story and teachings about monarch butterflies and their connection to Indigenous culture. So if you're participating at home today, everyone, um, we're encouraging uh, you to visit our website, www.monarchteacher.ca. We've got loads of activities that you can download, coloring sheets um, that have um, wonderful images of the life cycle of the monarch butterfly that you can uh, print off and, and color at home. Uh, activities that you can do like uh, monarch butterfly origami. Uh, we've got uh, instructions for monarch uh, insect headbands and uh, lots of different things and we're hoping that if you create any of these um, any of these activities or do any of the coloring that you can share it uh, via posting on social media with the hashtag feel the flutter so uh, looking forward to seeing all of your wonderful creations today now stay tuned for a live program at 10 30 uh, with uh, Emily, Michelle, um, uh, Redmond, and Sarah, who will be taking us through uh, the life cycle, the migration, and the anatomy of the monarch butterfly. And there are some really, really fantastic drawings uh, that, that they'll be sharing with us as well. So we'll see you shortly.
Well, you're on, Vicky. Welcome back, everyone. I'm really, really excited for our first live program today. We'll be joined by TRCA's Ravine Youth Team crew, uh, consisting of Emily, Michelle, Sarah, and Redmond. They're on location at Humber Arboretum, and they'll be sharing some really fun facts about the life cycle of the monarch butterfly, its migration, and uh, its biology. So without further ado, take it away, crew. Good morning, everyone. I'm SJ. Today we are live streaming from the beautiful Humber Arboretum, where we'll be sharing with you knowledge about monarch butterflies from a biological perspective. But first, we would like to take a moment to express our gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we are on and to honor the people who have been living, working, and caring for this land since time immemorial. Today we are located within the Humber River watershed on the territory and Treaty 13 lands of the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, and many other diverse nations. Throughout the live stream, we will encourage everyone tuning in to pop your answers, thoughts, and questions into the chat. To kick it off, we want to know where is everyone tuning in from and what is your favorite butterfly? While you folks give us the lowdown, we just want to let you know that we'll be working with our incredible behind the scenes team to stay connected to all of you as we go. But if we do miss anything, do not fret. We will have a Q&A portion at the end. All right, awesome. So today we'll be talking about monarch anatomy, life cycle, lookalikes, and migration, as well as their crucial relationship to milkweed plants, which our Michelle will tell us about in just a hot second. But first, let's check your answers in the chat. But while we wait on the chat, tell us about where you're from and what kind of what's your favorite butterfly outside of the monarch. I I personally love swallowtails. Um, I just they seem to land on me. We have a good relationship <laughs> um, as well. Uh, I'm from Caledon, and I've been really fortunate to be able to spend a lot of time in the meadows. Um, but if I really had to choose, it'd be the dam so far. <laughs> but um, okay, so we'll just come back to that later. But even if monarchs aren't your favorite butterfly, tough taters, because that's what we're talking about today. Um, so we're going to go over to Michelle now to hear about milkweed. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle, and I'll be talking about the marvelous milkweed. So right here, we have the common milkweed. And milkweeds are important because the monarch butterflies will only land on milkweed and they'll lay their eggs on it. And only the monarch caterpillars can eat the milkweed because the milkweed has a special substance that only the, the caterpillars can handle it. So we've been all over Ontario. We'll be focusing on three milkweeds. So here we have the common milkweed where you can tell it is common because there is a pale green oval leaf and it has a red spotty stem and it if you can touch it, it, ta it uh, touches really nice. It feels really nice. So if you see one, touch it. And right here, we have the butterfly milkweed. And you can see that the leaves are darker green, it's smaller and it's more narrow. And you can see the, the flowers, it is orange. But unfortunately, we don't have the flowers for the swamp and common milkweed. But for the swamp, uh, it has a, a darker pink flower. But as you can see, <laughs> the leaves are longer, but it's also narrow, but it's very different from the common and butterfly milkweed and over here we have the seed pods we have the green seed pod that is not viable but when it turns brown it will pop up and it will fluff up and all of the seeds will travel into the wind it will find new places for a better life <laughs> so what makes the milkweed special well it has a milky substance that will allow the caterpillars to store the substance within their own body and when they turn into an adult those chemicals will get stored into the wind so it is a defensive mechanism when the butterfly gets bitten by like a predator the predator will taste uh, that it's very bitter and it doesn't taste nice so it will leave the butterfly alone and the butterfly will continue leaving and it is it is really cool there's a butterfly right here Okay. Oh, it's missed it. Well, we have SJ right here who will talk about the life cycle. Hey, it's SJ again. 
and I'm going to share with all of you some monarch butterfly anatomy and biological life history. So monarchs are part of the order Lepidoptera, which means scaly wings, and their scientific Latin name is Dinus plexippus. Their ancestors found in fossils from the Devonian period were determined to be 400 million years old. And since then, today's modern butterfly has become a master of metamorphosis, as you can see on these illustrations I've made for you all today. The four-stage process it undergoes to transform from an egg to a larva to a pupa to a butterfly. Monarchs can go through complete metamorphosis in a month or less, and it all starts with a shiny, tiny, milky little egg, as small as a needle point, which will be blown up here for your viewing pleasure. <laughs> it will hatch in three to five days after being laid, and just before hatching, the top will turn brown. Then poof, the first instar is born, and the larval stage begins, and it chomps its way out of the egg and devours the rest for its first nutritious meal. The caterpillar stage lasts about two weeks, which during this time, the little fellows will chomp and chomp and chomp milkweed, bulking up so hard and fast that they burst out of their skin. The little bottomless pits uh, will shed between each of the five instars to reveal their fuller figures and bolder markings. So let's talk a little more about the bodies of these milkweed guzzlers. The caterpillars have three main body parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. The head includes six eyes, a mouth, a very small pair of antennae that you can't even see, and a silk-producing spinneret, while the abdomen uh, comprises of two long pairs of tentacles and three pairs of true legs. And the abdomen has five pairs of prolegs ending with a short pair of tentacles at the caboose. So monarchs in the caterpillar phases are super vulnerable to dying even though they make sure to munch on heaps of milkweed to make sure they keep themselves poisonous. So here's a question for you. How many caterpillars do you think make it to the butterfly phase? Is it 2%, 14%, 48%, or 66%? While you ponder that, I'll tell you a little more about the threats these little sweeties face. Predators like the wasp will lay eggs on their skin which hatch into larvae that suck on their juices. Also inexperienced birds will, you know, take a chomp on them, not knowing how sick that they will become. Also disease, very hot or cold weather, pesticides, and a lack of food can wipe out a whole bunch of them. Which brings me to the answer of our question. So if you said 2%, you're my kind of realist. The lucky few who do make it to the J stage uh, will spit out a silk button onto a surface, flip around and grab it with their back legs, and then stick a black stem into it to make an anchor for their chrysalis. And then presto, the pupa stage begins. So I'm gonna take a moment to just say how incredible this is, because this is Larry, Michelle's little caterpillar, which happened to go from J phase to dancing queen to green pupa all, all in the last 30 minutes. And I don't know if you can see there, but its skin is just chilling on the, on the milkweed below. So that's pretty incredible that we got to witness that. <laughs> Anyways, so what we just saw with Larry is the soft yellow green pupa begins to dance inside its skin like there's no tomorrow and twerks its way out of its last pair of caterpillar clothing. Uh, when the pupa gets tired of all that dancing, it chills out and the chrysalis begins to harden, which is what we're seeing here. The entire pupa phase lasts around two weeks when the monarch does a whole lot of nothing, at least from an outsider's perspective. But if you look very closely at the green casing here, you can see indentations of developing wings, hinting to us that there's a whole lot of magic going on inside. And then towards the end is the dark pupa phase, where on the final day of metamorphosis, um, the chrysalis will turn clear and the butterfly will begin to emerge and the butterfly phase begins. This all takes about an hour. So all of this is pretty quick. And finally, at this point, the butterfly gets to release its waste. So can you imagine holding, your, like needing to go to the bathroom for 14 days? Like I, I sure, I sure can't. So that's pretty <laughs> impressive as well. Um, but anyways, over the next several hours, it will, the wings will begin to dry out and they will unfold. And you can see here this really juicy abdomen, all the fluid from inside it will pump into the wings, getting them ready for flight. It's ready to launch when you see two dry sets of wings, like in this caterpillar here, or sorry, modern butterfly here. Uh, and 
they're all covered in orange, black, and white scales. These scales provide lift, help regulate body temperature, and their coloration warns against predators. Uh, and another cool feature to mention, just before we move on, is the proboscis, proboscis sorry, which is a twirly swirly tongue that the monarch has, and it untwirls to slurp nectar from flowers. So now, how does this process cycle back full circle? Well, starting three days after emergence, both adult males and females are ready to mate, and they will begin to do so many times over the course of their lives. Females lay several hundred eggs each time, typically one egg on the underside of a single milkweed leaf on a single milkweed plant. So how do we figure out if the monarch is male or female? It's impossible to tell when it's at the egg or caterpillar stage, but when it's a pupa, if you see a tiny little vertical line just below the dots, uh, below the anchor point or cremaster on the pupa, then you know it's a female. But how do we know if an adult butterfly is going to be male or female? And how do we know if we're even looking at a monarch, or monarch butterfly at all? Over to Redmond to find out. Hi, Redmond. Cameras are fun. Today. Yeah. So, yeah. So, as you were saying, we'll talk about a little bit how you tell once a monarch is in the adult stage, how you tell the difference between a male and a female monarch. And bear with us uh, as we go through this. We are using an iPad. You know, as millennials, we love our technology. We're using gimbals, iPhones. There might be a bit of glare. So, but let's test your knowledge and those big old brains of yours because I know you have them. So, if you look closely, you'll see two images of monarchs. So we'll name the top one A and the bottom one B. So which one do you think is the male and which do you think is the female? So think about what you typically see in nature. You think of deer, you know, the males typically have the giant antlers that they use for attraction. You think of birds, the male birds are usually a lot more vibrant in color because that's how they attract the mate. But when you look at a monarch, do you think one's brighter in color, one's bigger? Do you see any special glance, hint, hint, nudge, nudge? Well double check your answers at the end of the stream but if you guessed a for male you are correct so the way you can tell is right here there are two scent glands so those are specific to male monarchs and that's what they use for attraction and mating when you look at the female monarch you'll see there are no glands here and when you compare the veins one's typically a little thicker than the other and if you hold the camera there for a second I will show you what it looks like on the underside of the wing. Because you're not always going to see the bottom side of the wing because typically you'll see a monarch in this position on a flower. But you can see here, very faintly, you might be able to see the gland from the underside of the wing if you're seeing a monarch with its wings closed. So that's one way you can tell. So, and we'll show you another image shortly. So right here, we have two butterflies. Now, do you see anything different about these? Are these two different monarchs? Is one a rare variation? You know, sometimes you have albino animals or things like that. What do you think? Because I will give you a hint that this is an instance of malarian mimicry, which essentially means that both these butterflies are exhibiting the same color palette to warn off predators that they are noxious to essentially noxious to other animals. So kind of this is their warning system. So they develop the same kind of color pattern. You see the white dots, all the veining. But the key difference is across this top butterfly, you'll see a horizontal line. And that's not some weird monarch mutation. This is actually a completely different butterfly called the Viceroy. So these monarchs both decided that we're going to be orange with a white stripe or a black stripe around and white dots to say, hey, don't eat us. Kind of like when every guy and their granddad was wearing a man bun because they thought it looked good. Same thing, they both thought orange, that's peak toxicity. So if you ever see those in the wild, it's a little bit, a little bit harder to see them if they're in flight, but if you ever catch them on a flower like this, look for that horizontal line and you'll know it's a viceroy. If you're looking at breeding monarchs, you don't want to feed a viceroy because they will feed on completely different plants. And as another example of something you might get confused about is we have 
three very similar looking butterflies. And if you're catching along, these are all completely different. So they're not, they're not the same butterfly. It's not another rare mutation. I know the first time I saw this guy over here, I thought it definitely looks like a monarch. You can see this. If you look very closely, you can see the veining. It's almost the same structure. You got the same glands, you got the same dots, and even the head, it looks very similar. And again, we just talked about the vice roy. You got the horizontal line. But this one here is actually a queen butterfly. So you'll see those mostly in the southern U.S., but it is in the same family. That's why they look very similar. So you might think it's a rare monarch. Sorry, you didn't make a new discovery. It's just a different butterfly in the same family. So the way you can tell, it's slightly more obvious here, but it's a little paler. The veins aren't as dark, and you'll get the white dots across the wing. Whereas the monarch, they'll be all around. And it is a little easier to tell, or I would say it's a little more difficult to tell when they're in the caterpillar stage, if you don't know what you're looking for. So what you see here are almost the same butterflies. So if you can guess which one's which, we'll go A, B, C, D. If you can guess which caterpillar is which, but I'll go through it. So here, if you know what your monarch caterpillar looks like, since we just went through the presentation, this guy is the monarch. And you'll see up here is the queen butterfly. So they're very similar in color. Again, if you don't know what you're looking for, you might think it's a rare mutation, or you might even mistake it for the monarch. But you'll see that there are actually three sets of tentacles, whereas the monarch will only have two. And this guy is a black swallowtail. So that one, again, very similar in color, but you'll own, you won't find this one on milkweed. So that's kind of your big hint. If it's not on milkweed, it's probably not a monarch caterpillar. And this guy here, even though we just said the monarch, the butterfly looks very similar, that's the Viceroy. It's really hard to get that confused. Um, yeah, I mean, doesn't look great, but the monarch, the Viceroy butterfly looks very pretty, just like the monarch. But yeah, very different caterpillars. But so those are some little hints that you can do for identification. But for now, we'll switch over to Michelle and talk about a little bit of butterfly migration. Hi, everyone. So I'll be talking about the migration of the monarch butterfly. What is special about it is that they will journey all the way from here, Canada, all the way to the south, which is in, in central Mexico. And they will be there in the mountains. So when it's, it is in the late summer, there will be a special generation of monarch butterflies that will, <laughs> that will, um, they're called a super monarch. So they are generally bigger than the normal monarch butterfly as um, their wings tend to be bigger and they live longer. That is the case. It is because the when the super monarchs, when they get, um, when they hatch out their egg, so they'll inhibit their, their hormones that will pre prevent them from mating. And so they'll spend all the time and energy pollinating flowers, getting all the nectar, and they'll use those stored energy to travel like very far away. And can anyone guess how far the journey will take? You can type it in the comments below. And during the time as they travel 50 to 100 miles every day, all the way to central Mexico. And can you guess what they do there? So when they arrive, they will, they will land on the branches of a tree. Of, uh, it's a specific fir tree. So they'll, they'll land on the branches and they'll huddle up all together, creating a warm blanket. And it's such a beautiful spectacle that one day you should join it. But if you can't, you can only imagine it from my description. Okay. And it will, so the warmth will create a microclimate where the butterflies will stay warm, they'll stay alive, and they'll stay there for a few weeks, braving up the cold. And once the cold is gone, They'll come back, they'll travel all the way back to Canada, and that, that's where their, their cycle ends. Alright, so we'll now be answering the Q&A session. All the comments and questions that will be on YouTube. So we are running a little short on time today, even though this is a live stream, we have other content planned for the day. But if you have any questions, pop in the chat. We'll go through there, answer anything in the comments. Um, but we have a lot more content throughout the day. You can see the nice, lovely monarch. We have a guardian demonstration stream later at 12, 11.30. 11.30. Yes. So stay tuned for that. Grab a break. Go to the washroom. See if you can find some monarchs. And we'll be back soon.
Yay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily, Sarah, Michelle, and Redmond for that incredibly interactive and really beautiful live program. And uh, just a shout out to Sarah. I heard that you uh, hand drew all of those wonderful life cycle images. So thank you. Thank you for sharing those with us. They were absolutely stunning. Uh, so we hope that you enjoyed that program. Our next program is going to be live at 1130 with our second Ravine Youth Team crew, Scott, Caitlin, Jacob, and Adam. So we hope you join us for the next program, and we'll see you soon.
And we're back. Thank you so much for joining us once again in celebration of Flight of the Monarch Day. Um, if you're just tuning in, my name is Vicki Ann with the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, and we're super excited to bring you a, a very special treat today. Uh, the TRCA Ravine Youth Team, Scott, Caitlin, Alessandra, Scott, Caitlin, Jacob, and Adam will be joining us from Budapest Park uh, on Humber Bay. And they're going to be walking us through how to plant a monarch-friendly garden. And uh, we're really excited for, uh, for their program, their live program today. So uh, without further ado, take it away. Hey everyone, my name is Caitlin, aka Monica the Monarch Butterfly, and today we're going to be talking to you about why we care so much about conserving this beautiful species, and how you can make your own beautiful butterfly garden right at home. So first of all, why do we care about conserving monarch butterflies? Well for one, they're considered a charismatic species, which means that they have widespread popular appeal, just like polar bears, elephants, and panda bears. Secondly, they are pollinators, so they transfer pollen grains from the male part of the flower to the female part of the same or different flower, so that they produce the, the seeds and fruits in which we eat. Which leads me into my second, uh, third point, sorry, uh, that they do impact our human food systems. Because of their population declining, they're not fertilizing the, these plants, and they're not creating those seeds and fruits in which we eat. Also, if their populations are declining, that means Parallel, uh, parallel to other pop pollinators population declining such as bees. So they're also in trouble as they share the same habitat. Last but not least, the fact that this tiny insect that weighs less than a paperclip travels super far all the way to central Mexico to the overwintering sites is a phenomenon that deserves to be protected. So why did they go to Mexico? Well, it provides that microclimate for them to, do this, to have their resting stage in. So it provides that ideal temperature of zero to 15 degrees Celsius uh, so that they can slow down their metabolism and conserve their energy stores. Secondly, it provides enough humidity so that their wings do not dry out. Also, um, they also go up high, high in the mountains in central Mexico uh, where it's dense coniferous forest. So if there was illegal logging of this area, it would take away from their habitat, which means that they're gonna be in trouble when they need to rest. If the climate got even to lower temperatures than it would have been, then that also means that they would have to use their energy stores and they would be disrupted in their sleep. Um, Mexico is, sorry, the migration to Mexico, um, how they know to go there is that they have two cues. So one of the cues is milkweed, which Adam's going to go into more depth later. Uh, but milkweed is a plant that they use to complete their life cycle as well as a food source. So when they start to notice that the seed pods are drying out, that they're becoming mature, um, that they're yellow and of poor quality, they know that this is their cue to leave. Secondly, they'll use day length. So as they approach to the fall season, the day length is shorter, the temperatures are dropping. And of course, with climate change approaching or something is getting warmer, this would affect their migration pattern and they would leave later than they usually would. So that's why it's also important to conserve this. Um, how do they know that their migration, sorry, that their population was declining? Well, they actually have uh, a taking method that they use the a little sticker on the mitten-shaped cell. They just stick it on there. It doesn't affect their locomotion or injure them at all. Um, and they're able to collect data to see how far they travel and how many actually get to their overwintering sites in central Mexico. And they noticed that in 2012 that they occupied a huge uh, part of that land. It was 4.09 hectares of land. And then in 2014, it dropped to 0 0.68 hectares of land. So this drastic drop in over two years was definitely a red flag and a driving force for conservation efforts. So now I'm actually going to pass it on to Adam, who's going to talk to you guys about my favorite plant, the milkweed. Hi guys, I'm Adam and I'm your milkweed guy. Did you know that there are over 200 types of milkweed found across North America, South North America, South America, and Africa. Canada is home to 14 species of milkweed, 12 of which are found right here in the province of Ontario. In 2010, milkweed was added to Ontario's species at risk list. Its, its status is listed as endangered, meaning that it's facing imminent threat of extinction and extirpation. White milkweed, 
uh, is actually native to Canada, but it's currently only found in the United States now. Um, okay, but what does milkweed have to do with monarchs? Well, the, answer, the quick answer is that it has everything to do with monarchs. The fate of, the fate of monarchs is, is linked to um, the survival of milkweed. Milkweed. Milkweed provides monarchs with a home. It's needed during its migratory stops, and it provides a food source. No milkweed means no monarchs. In Canada, the population of monarchs has declined by 80% over the last two decades. This is largely due to agricultural and residential land use. Deforestation and the use of herbicides and pesticides have led to, to this decline. Also, invasive species, such as common buckthorn, have led to a decline in habitat quality. Common buckthorn towers over milkweed, which grows at about two to five feet, and steals its necessary sunlight. Um, all right, so enough of this doom and gloom, Adam. Let's be responsible, let's take action. All right, sounds good. So the first ingredient is into a, a building a successful habitat is transitioning our home and community gardens into more butterfly friendly gardens. Okay, so what ingredient are we gonna use here? I think you guys know the answer to this. Let's say it with me. One, two, three. Milkweed! milkweed. Yes, monarchs love their milkweed. One monarch caterpillar will eat a whole leaf within five minutes. After it emerges from its egg, it'll be a, a, a milkweed eating machine for the next 10 to 14 days and can eat eat up to 200 times its own weight. Wow, and I felt guilty every time I ate a medium pizza by myself. <laughs> um, and, and they're not just picky eaters. Monarchs have also evolved to form a special relationship with milk, milkweed. The plant gets its name because it contains a toxin, a milky sappy toxin uh, within. And uh, mon a monarch's physiology, unlike other animals, plants, and in uh, birds and insects, allows a monarch to eat milkweed and ingest its toxin without taking on its harmful effects. This is key because it protects the monarch because other predators have learned to stay away from this toxin and stay away from monarchs. Okay, TikTok, let's go. We gotta get into our garden here, folks. So over here, we've got swamp milkweed. So I'm gonna recommend that you plant three types of milkweed in your garden. So we're gonna use common milkweed, swamp milkweed and butterfly milkweed. So like I said, this is swamp milkweed and you can see that it's planted about one foot apart from, from each other. So we'll have ideally 20 to 30 plants in our garden and you don't have to clump them all together. We have another five plants of milkweed over there. So spread them out. Diversity is key to the success of building your butterfly garden. All right, well, that's enough for milkweed for now. Um, how else can we diversify our garden? Uh, Scott, can you tell us about some flowering plants? Yeah, of course. Hey guys, my name's Scott. I'm also with the Ravine team, and I'm gonna be telling you a little bit about the flowers that you need to build your perfect monarch garden. You just come with me. Make sure to watch your step. It's a little bit uh, precarious over here. It's awesome that we have this beautiful, beautiful day for Flight of the Monarch Day. The sun is out, and that means the monarchs are out too. They love warming themselves in the sun's rays. But we're gonna make our way over here to the garden. We got some good flowers for you. I know it's a long way, but we're almost here. <laughs> so, as Adam mentioned, in your monarch garden, you need a few types of milkweed. At least two species, probably, and quite a few plants of each. Uh, and that milkweed provides habitat and food for the caterpillars, as has been mentioned. But what can you do for those adult butterflies? Well, the adult butterflies really need that sweet, sweet nectar from some beautiful flowering plants. Now I'm going to tell you a few tidbits about how you can plant your perfect monarch garden in the plants that are necessary. First and foremost, 
you want a wide variety of different plants. And ideally, they're all going to have different blooming times. So that means you've got some plants that are blooming in the spring. They're going to be there for the early arrivals. But you're also going to have things that are blooming in the summer, things that are blooming in the fall. It's really going to keep the monarchs coming back for more. They know that your garden is the best spot in the neighborhood for a, a constant supply of snacks. It's like you want a place where you can keep on going back to the fridge, eating some more snacks. They're going to be sipping up that nectar until they're all full. Second thing that you're going to think about is that you're going to want a wide variety of different colors in the flowers in your garden. If you come with me a little bit here, as we look around, we've got some beautiful purples. We've got some pinks some yellows and we can actually I don't know if you can see there but we've got a beautiful monarch right in there the monarchs have been loving this bush today so these bright colors will really pop out to the monarchs and it will attract them to your garden so you want some purples pinks reds oranges you name it so that's two things so far different flowers with different blooming times different flowers with different colors last but not least let's try to include some native wildflowers in our garden this isn't essential, but we highly recommend it. Uh, the reason for this is it's going to support your local biodiversity. Uh, and not only that, but the local wildflowers are adapted to our local climate and soil conditions. So it's really going to make things a lot easier for you as well. And, you know, we all could do with a little less work. Um, so some things that you want to avoid when you're planting your garden, stay away from those insecticides and pesticides. They can have really bad effects on the monarch butterflies themselves. And the last thing that we want to do when we're creating this habitat for them is doing more harm than good. The last thing I'll mention is try to stay away from hybridized flowers. Sometimes when these breeders breed these flowers with beautiful blossoms, uh, it takes away from the pollen, the nectar and the scent. So ultimately that's not going to be attracting the, the monarchs too much. So now that we've talked about how to build your garden, you need some milkweeds, you need some flowers and a, ideally a good diversity of both. We're going to teach you how to plant them. And I'm going to throw it over to Jacob, who's really going to get his hands dirty over here. Hello, everyone. Welcome to beautiful Budapest Park, where we're going to do a quick planting demonstration for your pollinator garden. So we selected this beautiful little area site to put in these rocks here. Um, you can just make your way down. Bear with us for a second. Right. Oh Next yeah, we're, we're all good. Here. So when you're selecting your pollinator garden, if you already have your property, um, you want to, the first thing you want to think about is site selection. So when picking an area for your butterfly garden, your pollinator garden, you want full sun. We're planting a lot of flowers here and they're really, they want that sun. They need the energy. And so do the monarchs. They love to bask in the sun's rays. Um, so you want, you want a very sunny spot, preferably that southern exposure. You also want a lot of drainage. Uh, you want to make sure that the plants don't get too wet. As these are, most of the species we're going to go over, prairie-based plants. They can take the heat. As Scott was saying, they can take a little bit of abuse. They can be neglected. Um, and they are native to our environment here in southern Ontario. So they're, they're very well adapted. So... When you're picking your spot in your garden, if you already have a beautiful garden established and you just want to put in a little piece of pollinator heaven here, um, when you're digging out an area, one thing to consider, their lifeblood milkweed, the common milkweed, uh, as Adam was speaking about, can be, it's very vigorous. It loves to grow, given the opportunity. Um, it has these beautiful, we're going to show a little demonstration here, but it has a beautiful little parachute and that's what helps it spread so well. Uh, carries the seed by the air but those plants they also kind of grow laterally underground which some people may not know in the chat but they have these the mechanism or physiology called a rhizome and that's basically an underground root think of it almost as a potato and that what that is what allows milkweed to come up every year and get more vigorous in area so if you already have an established garden something you might want to think about is installing an underground barrier. Just a simple two by four or two by six um, buried in the ground there, it will stop that lateral spread of common milkweed. Uh, also in the fall, when it goes to seed, you can snip some of the pods off and that will keep the seed bank a little bit smaller if you just have a little taste of pollinators. 
Uh, we also recommend maybe planting different types of milkweed that are a little bit less vigorous, such as swamp milkweed. It doesn't spread as, as much, but monarchs still love it. Or butterfly weed, as the previous presentation was speaking about. It's also got some beautiful colors there with the orange. Um, so that's a pretty central part in your garden. Uh, so we're just going to go over how do you get that going. Essentially, you know, it is a bit early right now, but if you're out and about, you might see some milkweed and you'll see these very distinct pods. They're very elongated. This one's a bit opened up, uh, but they'll look like this and you'll see them just protruding out of the plant, the stem. So again, these are a bit early, so they are a little bit extra green, but in a couple weeks, they'll start to turn brown and they'll crack open. And that's when you know the seed is absolutely ready. It's primed. So it'll start to crack open like this. You'll see those uh, beautiful white kind of fluff, almost little feather-like pieces. And that's, again, for the seed, helps the seed spread. We see it in the air here. Um, so when they start to open, what you can do, if you have some milkweed around you, you want to harvest it, you can wrap a couple of rubber bands around the pods. And that just keeps it a little bit more closed to keep the seeds in there. So... But so when you're ready to collect, they have this like, they have that fluff, but um, well, these seeds, they need to go through a process called cold stratification. And basically that means it's a seed defense that helps it blossom or sprout at the right time. So they need a, a little cold period before they then spend their energy and shoot a little root down and then send that beautiful sprout up. So this process of cold stratification you can mimic it at your house uh, just by collecting the seeds when they're ready and they're open. Um, you can have a little bag, uh, just a plain Ziploc bag, put a mixture, 50% pea, 50% sand. You put your seeds in there and just have it a little bit moist, not too moist. You don't want sort of mold to start growing. We can keep that in the fridge and um, leave it there for about 30 days to 60 days, two months to really get those seeds time to then like figure out in their seed mine that I'm ready to sprout. So, but if you do end up doing that cold stratification in your fridge, I would recommend removing some of this fluff. So you can remove it simply by taking your seeds out when they're ready. See, these are sticking together. They're not absolutely ready, but they'll do for today. You take the seeds out and you can throw them in like a paper bag, throw a couple coins in there and give it a good shake. And that will just separate these tiny seeds from the fluff and that yeah that will kind of limit some of the rot that you might experience um, but preferably since we are going into the fall it's a great time to plant milkweed seed so just if you want to get in here all you have to do is let nature take its course here if you you have your area we have this little spot here I want some milkweed seeds growing all you have to do is scratch up that top surface maybe work it a little bit Get it, that's primed enough for the seed. Take your little seeds. You don't even have to take the fluff off for this. Basically just spread them in. Throw them on top there. And then recommend just raking it back. Getting those seeds buried in. They don't know, they don't need to go very deep. Just maybe a quarter inch. You can also water it in now, would be a good time. It really just helps the seeds stay in that top layer because they want to come up in spring. So if we just go over here actually, we have a little milkweed sprout, common milkweed, just poking through this uh, mulch here. It's a little bit early, so the time's a bit off, but it is here and it'll be here next year, ready to give monarchs some food. So we go back here. Now milkweed is like a major piece of the puzzle, but it's not the only thing. We have to think, we gotta feed those butterflies, as Scott was saying. They need to eat throughout the year, so we wanna, when you're doing plant selection, you want a range of plants where they're constantly starting to blossom. So in that early spring, you can get plants like forget-me-not, you know, you can't forget it. So they'll, they'll give that early nourishment to those uh, migrating monarchs. Then we're kind of moving into fall, so we're more focused on the fall plants, uh, but, but throughout the year we can have blazing star, dense blazing star, uh, some cone flowers, echinacea. So right here for our demonstration, also goldenrod, uh, it's a great one for right now. So right here, if we want to get in close, we have a uh, bone set. It's a beautiful little native flower. This is a little bit 
sparse in here right now, but, but we got some bones set. And then we also have a young Echinesia sprouting up here. And then we have a couple here. We got a beautiful wild combine. Now it does look a bit done. It's a little bit past its prime, but that's okay. All these plants we're getting in the ground now in late fall here are going to come back next year because these are all perennials. They're going to be here. They're going to reseed in the ground. So just go over a quick demonstration on how to plant this beautiful Echinesia. And as Scott was saying, you want to pick plants that are not so hybridized. So if you are planting Echinesia, also known as coneflower, you want to go for this more pale pink color. That's, this is our closest native uh, coneflower to Southern Ontario. It's a beautiful prairie staple. So just to get the planting going here, obviously they come in these plastic pots, but we want it in the ground. We want to free this plant here. So we get our pot off and the, I don't know if you want to get in here. There's, you see all these roots that are wrapping around the pot. That's kind of, this plant is kind of pot bound. So when you're planting in the ground, you want to rough up the roots. You can be a bit aggressive with it. That just helps the plant spread out when it gets in the ground there and not grow around in a circle. Because sometimes the plants, they can get a bit confused. We are getting dirty here, as Scott was saying. So when you're planting, you want to dig your hole. You want to make sure it's the right depth, not too deep, not too shallow. You just want to cover it up to the top here and plug it in. Uh, and then, yeah, make sure it's at that right height. You don't want to go too high with the soil as it's possible the roots can kind of grow over and strangle the plant which is obviously a no-no it's horrible so when your plants in you got your little garden started you want to water it heavy like this these plants they're stressed they just went from this little confinement pot now they're out in the ground it's a little bit of a transition you know just like middle school so it's a bit awkward for the plant you know we got to water it heavy get it right and uh yeah, get it ready for the fall here. Also, when you're planting your native garden, something you want to do is plant in blocks of color. Scott was saying they love color, but it's kind of best to plant thick. If you're doing the seeding for um, milkweed, all the types of milkweed, go heavy with the seed as not all the seed will come up. And you can also pick through it if it's too dense, but it should be perfect. And also another thing to think about is with our, our native species, Sometimes they can be a little bit more sparse. So just really packing them in will still give that beautiful, like professional garden look with your native plants. Also, you can kind of pack them in through a W formation. It allows you to get the plants really in close together. And uh, that kind of concludes our little demonstration here in our pot at um, a Budapest park. And you know, if you've been admiring uh, Madame Monarch and her beautiful wings, you can go check out monarchteacher.com at TRCA and learn how to make your own wings. So now we'll just open up to questions in the chat. We had one question, Jacob. What's your what's your favorite milkweed? My favorite milkweed? Ooh, that's a tricky one. They're all so great. I thought I was saying there's like 200 species, but I, I would go with butterfly milkweed just because it's very drug tolerant. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And others might like some moisture, but yeah, let's go with the dry potter one. He loves a good uh, <laughs> butterfly weed. I would say that's weed. my absolute favorite meal. Butterfly weed, eh? I personally, I'm a common milkweed guy. We got to get it going. They love to spread and just give that, that huge biomass that these monarchs need to eat every year to then go through their life cycle. Yeah, so... When doing your, your plant selection, I guess one thing I can say, if you want to get back on the Echinesia here, that's a little bit of interest. I see the pollinators. Look at this. <laughs> so these gardens, they're not only just for monarchs, they can be for a range of pollinators, like bees in our little demo pot here. They just love it. Well, I guess that's all of our questions. Uh, thank you so much. and. Uh, Stay tuned for the next segment. Thanks so much to Scott, Jacob, Adam, and Caitlin for that fantastic demonstration and tutorial on how to create a monarch-friendly garden. And all of that fantastic information about milkweed and flowering nectar plants as well. Uh, 
I was going to go on a bit of a community science expedition. Do you think you might want to come with me? Awesome. All right. So let's head back into our milkweed patch and we'll go over to these milkweed plants, these common milkweed plants that uh, we visited at the beginning of our, uh, of our segment of our program today. So the community science project that uh, I've been participating in over the summer is called Mission Monarch. And it's a, it's a protocol that examines the reproductive success of monarch butterflies. So specifically, we're going to take a look at my plot, which I've been monitoring for some time, once a week. And we're going to count up the number of milkweed stems. And it can be any sized plot, really. It doesn't have to be a super big plot, but if you do have a very, very large stand of milkweed, the recommendation is that you do a sample of 20 plants, uh, but no more than 80. And uh, I've been counting up all of my milkweeds and I've got my field observation form here for Tommy Thompson Park. And I'll just write down that I have counted, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, about 27 milkweed plant. So I'll write it down here on my field observation form. And the next thing that we'll do is we'll go a little bit further into our exploration and our community science expedition and take a look at each of these plants for any evidence of monarch eggs, monarch caterpillars, monarch chrysalis, and monarch butterflies, adults as well. So Let's come on in a little bit closer and we can take a look at some of these milkweeds. Now, the way that I like to check a milkweed plant for um, any evidence of monarchs is I like to just gently um, pull it into four directions. Okay, and I do see a monarch egg here. Rachel, if you want to just zoom in, and we'll do a more comprehensive uh, look. And I also do see a very new first as well. So I'll make a note of that on my field observation form. So dipping in this direction, I, I can already find one. And then there's another egg here. It looks like a uh, laying female is performing what's called an egg dump. Typically, monarch uh, females will, reproductive females will only lay one egg per plant. Mm -hmm. And then there's another one here too. So this plant is actually seeing quite a number of eggs. So that's my count for this one stem of milkweed is three eggs and one caterpillar. Let's see if I see anything else in the other direction. Yes, I do. I see a second instar caterpillar here. Right here. Great, so I'll make a note of that. Maybe I'll just tip these leaves. Oh, look at this spider's nest here. Let's take a look at that. We won't, we won't put that on our observation form, but just really neat. Really neat to see. All right. And uh, generally, I would also do this direction here, just in case I missed anything. Lots of little red ants in this direction here. Little snail. All right, so I will get back to my observation form. And I have found two caterpillars. Now they're not uh, looking for the instar. It's just the number of caterpillars at any um, developmental stage or any stage of development. And then we found three eggs. And there are fields here for chrysalis and adults as well. Have you ever found a chrysalis in the wild? 
Me neither. They're really tough to find. All right, so I would go to my next plant, and I think systematically you'll kind of want to go through in a way that will kind of keep a logical order so that you will be able to uh, visit each one of these without duplicating your efforts. So let's just imagine that I've gone through these, I've added my findings, maybe I found an adult that was flitting by my plot, and then here I can certainly add, I think I saw one here, there's lots of caterpillars here in my plot. I've got a little, little caterpillar here. Looks to be about a third in star. And I think I found some other ones here. So my plot, in terms of its reproductive success, I would say it's pretty successful. Got lots of little bugs here on the goldenrod. I thought I saw another monarch in here munching away. So once I've completed my observations, I'll estimate the size of my site. I would say that this is about the size of a little smaller than a basketball court. So I'll say it's garden sized. And the estimated milkweed density on this site as well. So maybe I would classify this as maybe scattered, and then comment about today's field observation. And after I've completed my observations, I'm going to visit mission-monarch.org to upload all of this information, to input all of this information into my profile. The cool thing about inputting your data into your profile is you can also upload any photos that you might have that accompanies your field observations for the day. And again, all of this information helps with research and policy related to monarch butterfly conservation. Um, it really helps us understand, and the broader scientific community understand what exactly is happening with the breeding trends and the breeding patterns of monarchs when they're here in Canada. So that is just a quick tutorial on how to get involved with Mission Monarch. Again, visit www.mission-monarch.org to download the Mission Monarch Protocol Kit and learn a little bit more about how you can contribute to citizen science. All right. So with that, our next live program is going to be at 2 p.m. and we'll be joined by our third and final Ravine Youth Team crew, who will be uh, with a welcoming a special guest, April Nicole. She's a storyteller who will share um, a story about monarch butterflies with us. So please do come back at two o'clock and uh, we'll carry on with Flight of the Monarch Day 2021.
Thanks so much for returning to our live broadcast here at Tommy Thompson Park in Toronto, Ontario. For those of you just joining us for this final segment, my name is Vicki Ann and I'm with the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. And we're here to celebrate the second annual flight of the Monarch Day. And I want to give a big shout out and thanks to Albion Hills Community Farm, Y Marsh Wildlife Center and Nature Saskatchewan for participating in today's festivities. So thank you very much. And if anyone else is participating today, remember to post and share on social using the hashtag feel the flutter. And I'm thrilled to introduce our uh, final Ravith, Ravith, <laughs> Ravine youth team today, Doreen Vandevin, Vishal and Alessandro will be joining us from Evergreen Brickworks, filming on location at Evergreen Brickworks with a very special guest, storyteller April Nicole, who will be sharing a traditional teaching about monarch butterflies. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome for Flight of the Monarch Day. As Vicky said, we're here at Evergreen Brickworks, particularly in the children's garden. My name is Van. This is Bashal, this is Doreen, and behind the camera we have Alessandro. We are all from the Ravine team with the TRCA. But before we begin our day, I'd like to respectfully, respectfully acknowledge that we are working and living on the ancestral and current lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, specifically the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Chippewa, and other diverse Indigenous groups who we may not remember or be able to name. Today we are situated on Treaty 13 land signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, as well as on the Don River watershed and as part of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant Territory. The Great Lakes region has been and continues to be inhabited by Indigenous peoples who tend to the water and the earth, connect through diverse lifeways, and celebrate those deep connections in ceremony and living cultures. We must be stewards of the land, which provides us with everything we need, and to do our best to live sustainably and in right relations with the natural world. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live, work, and create on this territory and these diverse communities, including newcomers and settlers. Canada's historiography is a complete story. As guests who now call this land home, it is our responsibility to unlearn and to educate ourselves regarding the truth and to work towards reconciliation. I invite you to reflect on your relationship with this land and our treaty responsibilities and how your own people came here. Please also reflect on how you benefit from this land and waters, the stewardship of Indigenous peoples, and what you must do to preserve this area and its bounty from here on. Thank you. Now we will be transitioning to our guest speaker, Nicole, who will tell us a little bit more about herself, oh, sorry, April, who will tell us a little bit more about herself and also share some Indigenous stories and teachings that connect to the modern butterfly. Um, we will be displaying some nature visuals that we filmed here at uh, Evergreen Beckworks. And afterwards, we will have a short Q&A session. So if you have any questions that arise during the storytelling segment, uh, feel free to text them into the chat, and we will uh, be happy to get to them as soon as we can. For now, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Nicole, uh, April. <laughs> Bonjour, Tazi. My name is April, and I come from uh, Treaty 1 territory in Saskatchewan. Uh, I'd like to share with you a traditional story about how butterflies got their colors. When I say hey, you say ho. Hey, ho. 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 A long time ago, when the world was new and the creator had just put the world together with the sweat of his brow and the mud of the earth, Elder Brother was walking through the meadows. And as he walked, he saw the children laughing and singing and dashing between the many flowers and trees across the meadow. An elder brother sat and he watched those children and he smiled. And when he looked down at his feet, he saw the dried leaves of the aspen, the laughing leaf, and he became sad for he knew those children would grow up grow old, weaken, and die. And he thought to himself, I must gather all the colors of the earth 
so that all can see the laughter and beauty of the children. And so, Elder Brother took off his bag, his bag, and he began to collect the colors. Red, yellow, orange, purple, blue from the skies, white from the corn, and yellow from the sunlight. And as he walked through the meadow, he heard the songbirds sing, and he gathered up their songs and placed them in his bag. And then he called to the sh children, come, come see what I have, come gather. And the children ran to him laughing and singing. And when he handed him the bag, they paused. They looked to him and smiled and they gently opened the bag. And from that bag, many colors floated, flying this way and that, yellow and orange, blues and purples, the color of the sky, the color of the trees, the color of the flowers. And that was the first butterflies that touched the sky. And as they flew round and round, the children laughed and danced and listened to the songs. But then Elder Brother turned and saw all of the songbirds gathering. And the songbirds came to Brother and said, Elder Brother, those songs were given to us by the Creator. You have created beautiful creatures that are of all the colors of the rainbow, the sky, the flowers, but the songs belong to us. Ah, said Elder Brother, you are right. Those songs do belong to you. They were not mine to give. And so he gathered up the songs and gave them back to the songbirds. But those butterflies, oh, they danced across the meadows and they landed on this and that until they gathered upon the milkweed, those beautiful pink flowers. And they discovered the coal flower and the irises, and even oh, the lily pads upon the, the pond. And so it was. From that day to this, butterflies still dance across the skies, landing on this flower and that, and they have so many colors, but not a single song could be heard. That is how Elder Brother created butterflies. Thank you for listening. That song was given to me by my elder. And in our tradition, when you hear a story, you always acknowledge who it comes from and what it means to you. And that means to me, I hear those songs and I hear the laughter of children and I see the beautiful flowers across the meadow. And I thank the great spirit for all the beauty upon the earth. Awe, thank you for listening. I'd like to say uh, thank you to our guest teacher, April, uh, April Nicole, for sharing that lovely story with us. Um, uh, as you all know, I heard the story from, just like you did, I heard the story from April Nicole, and what it means to me is just appreciating the beauty of nature. Um, I was able to imagine uh, the milkweed that can make us all the colors in nature, the songbirds, the butterflies, and yeah, I just think that's important and that's, uh, that's beautiful. I'd like to thank everyone here, uh, who, all the viewers at home who joined us for Flight of the Monarch today. I hope you enjoyed this experience just as much as we did. Um, again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to pop them into the chat and we will be happy to answer them as soon as we can. And um, thank you for joining us. This as we look for any questions in the chat. Um, I would like to ask anybody in the chat uh, what your favorite part of the story was. Do you have any viewers? I, I never really personally took time to 
to think of butterflies as being silent. And when you had shared that with us the other day, and particularly in that story, um, something, I don't know what, but something resonated with me, and I just wanted to share that I'm very thankful um, for kind of realizing that. And, and then, yeah, just the silence of butterflies, which I had never entirely really thought of or taken time to kind of realize. So thank you. And so thank you guys for joining us for Flight of the Monarch Day. I'd like to say thank you to April, our storyteller again. That was such a beautiful story. And thank you for taking the time out of your day to come join us and teach us your knowledge. Um, and we hope you guys enjoyed as well. Um, yeah, we'll see you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for that, for sharing that very, very moving uh, gift of, uh, of the story of the monarch butterfly, uh, April Nicole. That was a really, really wonderful way to wrap up our day of live programming. And I'm, I'm very thankful and very grateful for your sharing of knowledge. Thank you so much. And that's it. I want to thank everyone for watching and participating in the second annual Flight of the Monarch Day. Thanks for joining us for all of our live streams and all the fun that we've had today. And I, I wanted to mention that, you know, when we first started this, uh, this program and this event last year, you know, our focus was on the monarch butterfly and raising awareness about the monarch migration and that epic journey that they make 4,000 kilometers south to Mexico. But it's become so much more than that. Flight of the Monarch Day has become, um, you know, uh, an event that um, is connecting people and communities all across Canada on not just the monarch butterfly, but the way that we um, use and understand the land, uh, the connection that we have to monarchs and each other. And I'm so grateful for, for your participation in the day today. I hope you continue. I hope you visit our website and remember to share all of those posts using feel the flutter as the hashtag. And we hope you will join us next year. Thank you so much for tuning in and uh, have a great rest of the day. Happy Flight of the Monarch Day.